Good morning. You're listening to WVUDHD2 The Basement. I'm Zach Davis, and this is Our Brief Hour, where we celebrate the poetry and prose that makes Our Brief Hour on this earth a beautiful one. Today we're going to interrupt our series on King Arthur to do a two-part episode this week and next week in memory of Oliver Sacks. Oliver Sacks was a neurologist who died this past Sunday, August 30th, at the age of 82. Sachs is known for writing books with detailed case studies with some of the patients that he's worked with over the years. And these are remarkable books for the compassion and insight that Sachs shows, as well as the fascinating stories of people who are facing abnormal neurological conditions and the understanding the reader gets of just how how strange and challenging life can be with a brain that's not doing what it's expected to do. One of the more famous books that Oliver Sacks wrote is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, and that is a collection of stories about patients that he's seen. The title story is about uh, an older man who developed a condition called prosopagnosia, which means he couldn't distinguish faces. Like, he couldn't look at a face and connect it with a personal identity, or even connect it with the idea of faceness. It was just sort of a blur to him, a meaningless blur. So I'm joined by my mom, Lisa, again, and together we'll be reading some of the stories that Sachs wrote in this book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. The President's Speech. What was going on? A roar of laughter from the aphasia ward just as the president's speech was coming on and they had all been so eager to hear the president speaking. There he was, the old charmer, the actor with his practised rhetoric, his histrionisms, his emotional appeal and all the patients were convulsed with laughter. Well, not all. Some looked bewildered, some looked outraged. One or two looked apprehensive, but most looked amused. The president was, as always, moving. But he was moving them, apparently, mainly, to laughter. What could they be thinking? Were they failing to understand him? Or did they, perhaps, understand him all too well? It was often said of these patients, who, though intellect had the severest receptive or global aphasia, rendering them incapable of understanding words as such, though they nonetheless understood most of what was said to them. Their friends, their relatives, the nurses who knew them well, could hardly believe sometimes that they were aphasic. This was because, when addressed naturally, they grasped some or most of the meaning, and one does speak naturally, naturally. Thus, to demonstrate our aphasia, one had to go to extraordinary lengths as a neurologist to speak and to behave unnaturally, to remove all the extraverbal cues, tone of voice, intonation, suggestive emphases or inflection, as well as all visual cues, one's expressions, one's gestures, one's entire, largely unconscious personal repertoire and posture. One had to remove all of this, which might involve total concealment of one's person and total depersonalization of one's voice. Even to use a computerized voice synthesizer in order to reduce speech to pure words, speech totally devoid of what Frey called tone colour or evocation. With the most sensitive patients, it was only with such a grossly artificial mechanical speech, somewhat like that of the computers in Star Trek, that one could be wholly sure of their aphasia. Why all this? Because speech, natural speech, does not consist of words alone, nor, as Hewlings Jackson thought, propositions alone. It consists of utterance, an uttering forth of one's whole meaning with one's whole being, 
the understanding of which involves infinitely more than mere word recognition. And this was the clue to aphasiac's understanding, even when they might be wholly uncomprehending of words as such. For though the words, the verbal constructions per se, might convey nothing, spoken language is normally infused with tone, embedded with an expressiveness so deep, so various, so complex, so subtle, which is perfectly preserved in aphasia, though understanding of words be destroyed. Preserved, and more often, preternaturally enhanced. This too becomes clear, often in the most striking or comic or dramatic way, to all those who work or live closely with aphasiacs, their family or friends or nurses or doctors. At first, perhaps, we see nothing much the matter. And then we see that there has been a great change, almost an inversion in their understanding of speech. Something has gone wrong, has been devastated, it is true, but something has come in its stead, has been immensely enhanced so that, at least with emotionally laden utterance, the meaning may be fully grasped even when every word is missed. This, in our species, homo loquens, seems almost an inversion of the usual order of things an inversion and perhaps a reversion too, to something more primitive and elemental. And this perhaps is why Hewlings Jackson compared aphasiacs to dogs, a comparison that might outrage both. Though when he did this, he was chiefly thinking of their linguistic incompetencies rather than their remarkable and almost infallible sensitivity to tone and feeling. Henry Head, more sensitive in this regard, speaks of feeling tone in his 1926 treatise on aphasia and stresses how it is preserved and often enhanced in aphasiacs. Thus the feeling I sometimes have, which all of us who work closely with aphasiacs have, that one cannot lie to an aphasiac. He cannot grasp your words and so cannot be deceived by them. But what he grasps, he grasps with infallible precision, namely the expression that goes with the words, that total, spontaneous, involuntary expressiveness, which can never be simulated or faked, as words alone can, all too easily. We recognise this with dogs and often use them for this purpose, to pick up falsehood or malice or equivocal intentions, to tell us who can be trusted, who is integral, who makes sense, when we, so susceptible to words, cannot trust our own instincts. And what dogs can do here, aphasiacs do too, and at a human and immeasurably superior level. One can lie with the mouth, Nietzsche writes, but without the accompanying grimace, one nevertheless tells the truth. To such a grimace, to any falsity or impropriety in bodily appearance or posture, aphasiacs are preternaturally sensitive, and if they cannot see one, this is especially true of our blind aphasiacs, they have an ineffable ear for every vocal nuance, the tone, the rhythm, the cadences, the music, the subtlest modulations, inflections, intonations, which can give or remove verisimilitude to or from a man's voice. In this, then, lies their power of understanding, understanding without words what is authentic or inauthentic. Thus it was the grimaces, the histrionisms, the false gestures and, above all, the false tones and cadences of the voice, which rang false for those wordless but immensely sensitive patients. It was to these, for them, most glaring, even grotesque, incongruities and improprieties that my aphasic patients responded, undeceived, 
and undeceivable by words. This is why they laughed at the President's speech. If one cannot lie to an aphasiac in view of his special sensitivity to expression or tone, how is it, we might ask with patience, if there are such who lack any sense of expression and tone while preserving unchanged their comprehension for words? Patients of an exactly opposite kind. We have a number of such patients also on the aphasia ward, although technically they do not have aphasia, but instead a form of agnosia, in particular so-called tonal agnosia. For such patients, typically, the expressive qualities of voices disappear. Their tone, their timbre, their feeling, their entire character, while words and grammatical constructions are perfectly understood. Such tonal agnosias, or aprosodias, are associated with disorders of the right temporal lobe of the brain, whereas the aphasias go with disorders of the left temporal lobe. Among the patients with tonal agnosia in our aphasia ward, who also listened to the President's speech, was Emily D., with a glioma in her right temporal lobe. A former English teacher and poetess of some repute, and with exceptional feeling for language and strong powers of analysis and expression, Emily D. was able to articulate the opposite situation. How the President's speech sounded to someone with tonal agnosia. Emily D. could no longer tell if a voice was angry, tearful, sad, whatever. Since voices now lacked expression, she had to look at people's faces, their postures and movements when they talked, and found herself doing so with a care and intensity she had never shown before. But this, so it happened, was also limited, because she had a malignant glaucoma and was rapidly losing her sight, too. What she then found she had to do was to pay extreme attention to exactness of words and word use, and to insist that those around her did just the same. She could less and less follow loose speech or slang, speech of an elusive or emotional kind, and more and more required of her interlocutors that they speak prose, proper words in proper places. Prose, she found, might compensate in some degree for lack of perceived tone or feeling. In this way, she was able to preserve, even enhance, the use of expressive speech, in which the meaning was wholly given by the apt choice and reference of words, despite being more and more lost with evocative speech, where meaning is wholly given in the use and sense of tone. Emily D. also listened, stony-faced, to the President's speech, bringing to it a strange mixture of enhanced and effective perceptions. Precisely the opposite mixture to those of our aphasiacs. It did not move her. No speech now moved her. And all that was evocative, genuine or false completely passed by her. Deprived of emotional reaction... Was she then, like the rest of us, transported or taken in? By no means. He is not cogent, she said. He does not speak good prose. His word use is improper. Either he is brain damaged or he has something to conceal. Thus, the President's speech did not work for Emily D. either, due to her enhanced sense of formal language use, propriety as prose, any more than it worked for our aphasiacs, with their word deafness but enhanced sense of tone. Here then was the paradox of the President's speech. We normals, aided doubtless by our wish to be fooled, were indeed well and truly fooled. And so cunning was deceptive word use combined with deceptive tone that only the brain damaged 
remained intact, undeceived. The Twins When I first met the twins, John and Michael, in 1966 in a state hospital, they were already well known. They had been on radio and television and made the subject of detailed scientific and popular reports. They had even, I suspected, found their way into science fiction, a little fictionalized but essentially as portrayed in the accounts that had been published. The twins, who were then 26 years old, had been in institutions since the age of seven, variously diagnosed as autistic, psychotic, or severely retarded. Most of the accounts concluded that, as idiot savants go, there was nothing much to them, except for their remarkable documentary memories of the tiniest visual details of their own experience, and their use of an unconscious calendrical algorithm that enabled them to say at once on what day of the week a date far in the past or future would fall. This is the view taken by Stephen Smith in his comprehensive and imaginative book, The Great Mental Calculators. There have been, to my knowledge, no further studies of the twins since the mid-60s, the brief interest they aroused being quenched by the apparent solution of the problems they presented. But this, I believe, is a misapprehension, perhaps a natural enough one in view of the stereotyped approach, the fixed format of questions, the concentration on one task or another with which the original investigators approach the twins, and by which they reduce them their psychology, their methods, their lives, almost to nothing. The reality is far stranger, far more complex, far less explicable than any of these studies suggest, but it is not even to be glimpsed by aggressive formal testing or the usual 60 minutes-like interviewing of the twins. Not that any of these studies or TV performances is wrong. They are quite reasonable, often informative as far as they go, but they can find themselves to the obvious and testable surface, and do not go to the depths, do not even hint, or perhaps guess, that there are depths below. One indeed gets no hint of any depths unless one ceases to test the twins, to regard them as subjects. One must lay aside the urge to limit and test, and get to know the twins, observe them openly, quietly, without presuppositions, but with a full and sympathetic phenomenological openness as they live and think and interact quietly, pursuing their own lives spontaneously in their singular way. Then one finds there is something exceedingly mysterious at work, powers and depths of a perhaps fundamental sort, which I have not been able to solve in the 18 years that I have known them. They are indeed unprepossessing at first encounter, a sort of grotesque Tweedledum and Tweedledee, indistinguishable, mirror images, identical in face, in body movements, in personality, in mind, identical too in their stigmata of brain and tissue damage. They are undersized, with disturbing disproportions in head and hands, high-arched palates, high-arched feet, monotonous, squeaky voices, a variety of peculiar tics and mannerisms, and a very high degenerative myopia, requiring glasses so thick that their eyes seem distorted, giving them the appearance of absurd little professors, peering and pointing with a misplaced, obsessed, and absurd concentration. And this impression is fortified as soon as one quizzes them, or allows them, as they are apt to do, like pantomime puppets, to start spontaneously on one of their routines. This is the picture that has been presented in published articles and on stage. They tend to be featured in the annual show in the hospital I work in, and in their not infrequent and rather embarrassing appearances on TV. The facts under these circumstances are established to monotony. The twins say, give us a date, any time in the last or next 40,000 years. You give them a date, and almost instantly they tell you what day of the week it would be. Another date, they cry and the performance is repeated. They will also tell you the date of Easter during the same period of 80,000 years. One may observe, though this is not usually mentioned in the reports, that their eyes move and fix in a peculiar way as they do this, as if they were unrolling or scrutinizing an inner landscape, a mental calendar. They have the look of seeing, of intense visualization, although it has been concluded that what is involved is pure calculation. Their memory for digits is remarkable, and possibly unlimited. They will repeat a number of three digits, of thirty digits, of three hundred digits, with equal ease. This, too, has been attributed to a method. 
But when one comes to test their ability to calculate, the typical forte of arithmetical prodigies and mental calculators, they do astonishingly badly, as badly as their IQs of 60 might lead one to think. They cannot do simple addition or subtraction with any accuracy, and cannot even comprehend what multiplication or division means. What is this? Calculators who cannot calculate and lack even the most rudimentary powers of arithmetic? And yet they are called calendar calculators, and it has been inferred and accepted on next to no grounds that what is involved is not memory at all, but the use of an unconscious algorithm for calendar calculations. When one recollects how even Carl Friedrich Gauss, at once one of the greatest of mathematicians and of calculators too, had the utmost difficulty in working out an algorithm for the date of Easter, it is scarcely credible that these twins, incapable of even the simplest arithmetical methods, could have inferred, worked out, and be using such an algorithm. A great many calculators, it is true, do have a larger repertoire of methods and algorithms they have worked out for themselves, and perhaps this predisposed W. A. Horowitz at all to conclude this was true of the twins too. Stephen Smith, taking these early studies at face value, comments, Something mysterious, though commonplace, is operating here. The mysterious human ability to form unconscious algorithms on the basis of examples. If this were the beginning and end of it, they might indeed be seen as commonplace and not mysterious at all. For the computing of algorithms, which can be done well by machine, is essentially mechanical and comes into the sphere of problems, but not mysteries. And yet, even in some of their performances, their tricks, there is a quality that takes one aback. They can tell one the weather and the events on any day of their lives, any day from about their fourth year on. Their way of talking, well conveyed by Robert Silverberg in his portrayal of the character Melangio, is at once childlike, detailed, without emotion. Give them a date, and their eyes roll for a moment and then fixate, and in a flat, monotonous voice they tell you of the weather, the bare political events they would have heard of, and the events of their own lives, this last often including the painful or poignant anguish of childhood, the contempt, the jeers, the mortifications they endured, but all delivered in an even and unvarying tone without the least hint of any personal inflection or emotion. Here, clearly, one is dealing with memories that seem of a documentary kind, in which there is no personal reference, no personal relation, no living center whatever. It might be said that personal involvement, emotion, has been edited out of these memories in the sort of defensive way one may observe in obsessive or schizoid types, and the twins must certainly be considered obsessive and schizoid. But it could be said equally, and indeed more plausibly, that memories of this kind never had any personal character, for this indeed is a cardinal characteristic of eidetic memory such as this. But what needs to be stressed, and this is insufficiently remarked on by their studiers, though perfectly obvious to a naive listener prepared to be amazed, is the magnitude of the twins' memory, its apparently limitless if childish and commonplace extent and with this, the way in which memories are retrieved. And if you ask them how they can hold so much in their minds, a 300-figure digit or the trillion events of four decades, they say very simply, we see it. And seeing, visualizing, of extraordinary intensity, limitless range, and perfect fidelity seems to be the key to this. It seems a native physiological capacity of their minds, in a way which has some analogies to that by which A. R. Loria's famous patient, described in The Mind of a Nemonist, saw, though perhaps the twins lack the rare synesthesia and conscious organization of the nemonist's memories. But there is no doubt, in my mind at least, that there is available to the twins a prodigious panorama, a sort of landscape or physiognomy, of all they have ever heard or seen or thought or done, and that, in the blink of an eye, externally obvious as a brief rolling and fixation of the eyes, they are able, with the mind's eye, to retrieve and see nearly anything that lies in this vast landscape. Such powers of memory are most uncommon, but they are hardly unique. We know little or nothing about why the twins or anyone else have them. Is there then anything in the twins that is of deeper interest, as I have been hinting? I believe there is. It is recorded of Sir Herbert Oakley, the 19th century Edinburgh professor of music, 
that once taken to a farm, he heard a pig squeak and instantly cried, G-sharp! Someone ran to the piano, and G-sharp it was. My own first sight of the natural powers and natural mode of the twins came in a similar, spontaneous, and, I could not help feeling, rather comical manner. A box of matches on their table fell and discharged its contents on the floor. One hundred eleven! They both cried simultaneously. And then, in a murmur, John said, Thirty-seven. Michael repeated this. John said it a third time and stopped. I counted the matches. It took me some time, and there were one hundred and eleven. How could you count the matches so quickly? I asked. We didn't count, they said. We saw the 111. Similar tales are told of Zacharias Dace, the number prodigy, who would instantly call out 183 or 79 if a pile of peas was poured out, and indicate as best he could, he was also a dullard, that he did not count the peas, but just saw their number as a whole in a flash. And why did you murmur 37 and repeat it three times? I asked the twins. They said in unison, 37, 37, 37, 111. And this, if possible, I found even more puzzling, that they should see 111, 111-ness, in a flash was extraordinary, but perhaps no more extraordinary than Oakley's G-sharp, a sort of absolute pitch, so to speak, for numbers. But they had then gone on to factor the number 111, without having any method, without even knowing in the ordinary way what factors meant. Had I not already observed that they were incapable of the simplest calculations and didn't understand or seem to understand what multiplication or division was? Yet now, spontaneously, they had divided a compound number into three equal parts. How did you work that out? I said rather hotly. They indicated as best they could in poor, insufficient terms, but perhaps there are no words to correspond to such things that they did not work it out, but just saw it in a flash. John made a gesture with two outstretched fingers and his thumb, which seemed to suggest that they had spontaneously trisected the number, or that it came apart of its own accord, into these three equal parts by a sort of spontaneous numerical fission. They seemed surprised at my surprise, as if I were somehow blind, and John's gesture conveyed an extraordinary sense of immediate felt reality. Is it possible, I said to myself, that they can somehow see the properties, not in a conceptual abstract way, but as qualities, felt, sensuous, in some immediate, concrete way? And not simply isolated qualities, like 111-ness, but qualities of relationship? Perhaps in somewhat the same way as Sir Herbert Oakley might have said a third or a fifth. I had already come to feel through their seeing events and dates, that they could hold in their minds, did hold, an immense mnemonic tapestry, a vast, or possibly infinite, landscape in which everything could be seen, either isolated or in relation. It was isolation rather than a sense of relation that was chiefly exhibited when they unfurled their implacable, haphazard documentary. But might not such prodigious powers of visualization powers essentially concrete and quite distinct from conceptualization, might not such powers give them the potential of seeing relations, formal relations, relations of form, arbitrary or significant? If they could see 111-ness at a glance, if they could see an entire constellation of numbers, might they not also see at a glance, see, recognize, relate, and compare in an entirely sensual and non-intellectual way enormously complex formulations and constellations of numbers? A ridiculous, even disabling power. I thought of Borges' funes. We at once can perceive three glasses on a table. Funes, all the leaves and tendrils and fruit that make up a grapevine. A circle drawn on a blackboard, a right angle, a lozenge. All these are forms we can fully and intuitively grasp. Arenio could do the same with the stormy mane of a pony, with a herd of cattle on a hill. I don't know how many stars he could see in the sky. Could the twins, who seemed to have a peculiar passion and grasp of numbers, could these twins, who had seen 111-ness at a glance, perhaps see in their minds a numerical vine, with all the number leaves, number tendrils, number fruit, that made it up? 
A strange, perhaps absurd, almost impossible thought, but what they had already shown me was so strange as to be almost beyond comprehension, and it was, for all I knew, the merest hint of what they might do. I thought about the matter, but it hardly bore thinking about, and then I forgot it. Forgot it until a second spontaneous scene, a magical scene, which I blundered into completely by chance. This second time, they were seated in a corner together with a mysterious, secret smile on their faces, a smile I had never seen before, enjoying the strange pleasure and peace they now seemed to have. I crept up quietly so as not to disturb them. They seemed to be locked in a singular, purely numerical converse. John would say a number, a six-figure number. Michael would catch the number, nod, smile, and seem to savor it. Then he, in turn, would say another six-figure number, and now it was John who received and appreciated it richly. They looked at first like two connoisseurs wine-tasting, sharing rich tastes, rare appreciations. I sat still, unseen by them, mesmerized, bewitched. What were they doing? What on earth was going on? I could make nothing of it. It was perhaps a sort of game, but it had a gravity and an intensity, a sort of serene and meditative and almost holy intensity, which I had never seen in any ordinary game before, and which I certainly had never seen before in the usually agitated and distracted twins. I contented myself with noting down the numbers they uttered, the numbers that manifestly gave them such delight, and which they contemplated, savored, shared, in communion. Had the numbers any meaning, I wondered on the way home? Had they any real or universal sense? Or, if any at all, a merely whimsical or private sense, like the secret and silly languages brothers and sisters sometimes work out for themselves? And as I drove home, I thought of Luria's twins, Leosha and Yura, brain-damaged, speech-damaged, identical twins, and how they would play and prattle with each other in a primitive, babble-like language of their own. John and Michael were not even using words or half-words, simply throwing out numbers at each other. Were these Borgesian or Funesian numbers, mere numeric vines or pony manes or constellations, private number forms, a sort of number argot known to the twins alone? As soon as I got home, I pulled out tables of powers, factors, logarithms, and primes, mementos and relics of an odd, isolated period in my own childhood, when I too was something of a number brooder, a number seer, and had a peculiar passion for numbers. I already had a hunch, and now I confirmed it. All the numbers, the six-figure numbers, which the twins had exchanged, were primes. In other words, numbers that could be evenly divided by no other whole number than itself or one. Had they somehow seen or possessed such a book as mine, or were they in some unimaginable way themselves seeing primes in somewhat the same way as they had seen 111-ness or triple 37-ness? Certainly they could not be calculating them. They could calculate nothing. I returned to the ward the next day, carrying the precious book of primes with me. I again found them closeted in their numerical communion, but this time without saying anything, I quietly joined them. They were taken aback at first, but when I made no interruption, they resumed their game of six-figure primes. After a few minutes, I decided to join in and ventured a number, an eight-figure prime. They both turned towards me, then suddenly became still, with a look of intense concentration and perhaps wonder on their faces. There was a long pause, the longest I had ever known them to make. It must have lasted half a minute or more. And then suddenly, simultaneously, they both broke into smiles. They had, after some unimaginable process of testing, suddenly seen my own eight-digit number as a prime, and this was manifestly a great joy, a double joy to them, first because I had introduced a delightful new plaything, a prime of an order they had never previously encountered, and secondly because it was evident that I had seen what they were doing, that I liked it, that I admired it, and that I could join in myself. They drew slightly apart, making room for me, a new number playmate, a third in their world. Then John, who always took the lead, thought for a very long time. It must have been at least five minutes, though I dared not move and scarcely breathed, and brought out a nine-figure number, 
and after a similar time his twin Michael responded with a similar one. And then I, in my turn, after a surreptitious look in my book, added my own rather dishonest contribution, a ten-figure prime I found in my book. There was again, and for even longer, a wandering, still silence. And then John, after a prodigious internal contemplation, brought out a twelve-figure number. I had no way of checking this, and could not respond, because my own book, which as far as I know was unique of its kind, did not go beyond ten-figure primes. But Michael was up to it, though it took him five minutes, and an hour later the twins were swapping twenty-figure primes, at least I assumed this was so, for I had no way of checking it. Nor was there any easy way in 1966 unless one had the use of a sophisticated computer, and even then it would have been difficult for whether one uses Eratosthenes' sieve or any other algorithm, there is no simple method of calculating primes. There is no simple method for primes of this order, and yet the twins were doing it. Again I thought of Dees, whom I had read of years before in F. W. H. Meyer's enchanting book Human Personality. We know that Dace, perhaps the most successful of such prodigies, was singularly devoid of mathematical grasp. Yet he in twelve years made tables of factors and prime numbers for the seventh and nearly the whole of the eighth million, a task which few men could have accomplished, without mechanical aid, in an ordinary lifetime. He may be thus ranked, Myers concludes, as the only man who has ever done valuable service to mathematics without being able to cross the ass's bridge. What is not made clear by Myers, and perhaps was not clear, is whether Dace had any method for the tables he made up, or whether, as hinted in his simple number-seeing experiments, he somehow saw these great primes, as apparently the twins did. As I observed them quietly, this was easy to do because I had an office on the ward where the twins were housed, I observed them in countless other sorts of number games or number communion, the nature of which I could not ascertain or even guess at. But it seems likely or certain that they are dealing with real properties or qualities, for the arbitrary such as random numbers gives them no pleasure, or scarcely any, at all. It is clear that they must have sense in their numbers, in the same way perhaps as a musician must have harmony. Indeed, I find myself comparing them to musicians. Or to Martin, another patient, also retarded, who found in the serene and magnificent architectonics of Bach a sensible manifestation of the ultimate harmony and order of the world, wholly inaccessible to him, conceptually, because of his intellectual limitations. Whoever is harmonically composed, writes Sir Thomas Brown, delights in harmony and a profound contemplation of the first composer. There is something in it of divinity more than the ear discovers. It is an hieroglyphical and shadowed lesson of the whole world, a sensible fit of that harmony which intellectually sounds in the ears of God. The soul is harmonical, and hath its nearest sympathy unto music. Richard Walheim in The Thread of Life makes an absolute distinction between calculations and what he calls iconic mental states, and he anticipates a possible objection to this distinction. Some might dispute the fact that all calculations are non-iconic on the grounds that when he calculates, sometimes, he does so by visualizing that calculation on a page. But this is not a counterexample, for what is represented in such cases is not the calculation itself, but a representation of it. It is numbers that are calculated, but what is visualized are numerals, which represent numbers. Leibniz, on the other hand, makes a tantalizing analogy between numbers and music. The pleasure we obtain from music comes from counting, but counting unconsciously. Music is nothing but unconscious arithmetic. What, so far as we can ascertain, is the situation with the twins, and perhaps others? Ernest Talk, the composer, his grandson Lawrence Weschler told me, could readily hold in his mind after a single hearing a very long string of numbers, but he did this by converting the string of numbers to a tune, a melody he himself shaped corresponding to the numbers. Jedediah Buxton, one of the most ponderous but tenacious calculators of all time, and a man who had a veritable, even pathological, passion for calculation and counting, he would become, in his own words, drunk with reckoning, would convert music and drama to numbers. 
During the dance, a contemporary account of him recorded in 1754, he fixed his attention upon the number of steps. He declared after a fine piece of music that the innumerable sounds produced by the music had perplexed him beyond measure, and he attended even to Mr. Garrick only to count the words that he uttered, in which he said he perfectly succeeded. Here is a pretty, if extreme, set of examples. The musician who turns numbers into music, and the counter who turns music into numbers. One could scarcely have, one feels, more opposite sorts of minds, or at least more opposite modes of mind. I believe the twins, who have an extraordinary feeling for numbers, without being able to calculate at all, are allied not to Buxton but to talk in this matter. Except, and this we ordinary people find so difficult to imagine, except that they do not convert numbers into music, but actually feel them, in themselves, as forms, as tones, like the multitudinous forms that compose nature itself. They are not calculators, and their numeracy is iconic. They summon up, they dwell among, strange scenes of numbers. They wander freely in great landscapes of numbers. They create, dramaturgically, a whole world made of numbers. They have, I believe, a most singular imagination, and not the least of its singularities is that it can imagine only numbers. They do not seem to operate with numbers non-iconically, like a calculator. They see them directly as a vast natural scene. And if one asks, are there analogies at least to such an iconicity, one would find this, I think, in certain scientific minds. Dmitri Mendeleev, for example, carried around with him, written on cards, the numerical properties of elements until they became utterly familiar to him, so familiar that he no longer thought of them as aggregates of properties, but, so he tells us, as familiar faces. He now saw the elements iconically, physiognomically, as faces, faces that related, like members of a family, and that made up in toto, periodically arranged, the whole formal face of the universe. Such a scientific mind is essentially iconic and sees all nature as faces and scenes, perhaps all music as well. This vision, this inner vision, suffused with the phenomenal, nonetheless has an integral relation with the physical, and returning it from the psychical to the physical constitutes the secondary or external work of such science. The philosopher seeks to hear within himself the echoes of the world symphony, writes Nietzsche, and to reproject them in the form of concepts. The twins, though morons, hear the world symphony, I conjecture, but hear it entirely in the form of numbers. The soul is harmonical, whatever one's IQ, and for some, like physical scientists and mathematicians, the sense of harmony, perhaps, is chiefly intellectual. And yet I cannot think of anything intellectual that is not, in some way, also sensible. Indeed, the very word sense always has this double connotation. Sensible, and in some sense personal as well, for one cannot feel anything, find anything, sensible, unless it is in some way related or relatable to oneself. Thus the mighty architectonics of Bach provide, as they did for Martin, an hieroglyphical and shadowed lesson of the whole world. But they are also recognizably, uniquely, dearly, Bach. And this too was felt poignantly by Martin, and related by him to the love he bore his father. The twins, I believe, have not just a strange faculty, but a sensibility, a harmonic sensibility, perhaps allied to that of music. One might speak of it very naturally as a Pythagorean sensibility, and what is odd is not its existence, but that it is apparently so rare. One's soul is harmonical, whatever one's IQ, and perhaps the need to find or feel some ultimate harmony or order is a universal of the mind, whatever its powers, and whatever form it takes. Mathematics has always been called the queen of sciences, and mathematicians have always felt number as the greatest mystery, and the world as organized mysteriously by the power of number. This is beautifully expressed in the prologue to Bertrand Russell's autobiography. With equal passion I have sought knowledge. I have wished to understand the hearts of men. I have wished to know why the stars shine and I have tried to apprehend the Pythagorean power by which number holds sway above the flux. 
It is strange to compare these moron twins to an intellect, a spirit, like that of Bertrand Russell, and yet it is not, I think, so far-fetched. The twins live exclusively in a thought world of numbers. They have no interest in the stars shining or the hearts of men, and yet numbers for them, I believe, are not just numbers, but significances, signifiers whose significant is the world. They do not approach numbers lightly, as most calculators do. They are not interested in, have no capacity for, cannot comprehend calculations. They are, rather, serene contemplators of number, and approach numbers with a sense of reverence and awe. Numbers for them are holy, fraught with significance. This is their way, as music is Martin's way, of apprehending the first composer. But numbers are not just awesome for them, they are friends, too, perhaps the only friends they have known in their isolated autistic lives. This is a rather common sentiment among people who have a talent for numbers, and Stephen Smith, while seeing method as all-important, gives many delightful examples of it. George Parker Bitter, who wrote of his early number childhood, I became perfectly familiar with numbers up to 100. They became, as it were, my friends, and I knew all their relations and acquaintances. Or the contemporary Shyam Marath from India. When I say that numbers are my friends, I mean that I have some time in the past dealt with that particular number in a variety of ways, and on many occasions have found new and fascinating qualities hidden in it. So if in a calculation I come across a known number, I immediately look to him as a friend. Hermann von Helmholtz, speaking of musical perception, says that though compound tones can be analyzed and broken down into their components, they are normally heard as qualities, unique qualities of tone, indivisible wholes. He speaks here of a synthetic perception which transcends analysis and is the unanalyzable essence of all musical sense. He compares such tones to faces and speculates that we may recognize them in somewhat the same personal way. In brief, he half suggests that musical tones, and certainly tunes, are, in fact, faces for the ear, and are recognized, felt, immediately as persons, or personaities, a recognition involving warmth, emotion, personal relation. So it seems to be with those who love numbers. These two become recognizable as such, in a single, intuitive, personal, I know you. The mathematician Wim Klein has put this well, Numbers are friends for me, more or less. It doesn't mean the same for you, does it? 3,844? For you, it's just a 3 and an 8 and a 4 and a 4. But I say, hi, 62 squared. I believe the twins, seemingly so isolated, live in a world full of friends, that they have millions, billions of numbers to which they say hi, and which I'm sure say hi back. But none of the numbers is arbitrary, like 62 squared, nor, and this is the mystery, is it arrived at by any of the usual methods, or any method so far as I can make out. The twins seem to employ a direct cognition like angels. They see directly a universe and heaven of numbers. And this, however singular, however bizarre, but what right have we to call it pathological, provides a singular self-sufficiency and serenity to their lives and one which it might be tragic to interfere with or break. This serenity was, in fact, interrupted and broken up ten years later, when it was felt that the twins should be separated, for their own good, to prevent their unhealthy communication together, and in order that they could come out and face the world, in an appropriate, socially acceptable way, as the medical and sociological jargon had it. They were separated, then, in 1977, with results that might be considered as either gratifying or dire. Both have been moved now into halfway houses and do menial jobs for pocket money under close supervision. They are able to take buses if carefully directed and given a token, and to keep themselves moderately presentable and clean, though their moronic and psychotic character is still recognizable at a glance. This is the positive side. But there is a negative side, too, not mentioned in their charts because it was never recognized in the first place. Deprived of their numerical communion with each other, and of time and opportunity for any contemplation or communion at all, they are always being hurried and jostled from one job to another, 
They seem to have lost their strange numerical power, and with this the chief joy and sense of their lives. But this is considered a small price to pay, no doubt, for their having become quasi-independent and socially acceptable. One is reminded somewhat of the treatment meted out to Nadia, an autistic child with a phenomenal gift for drawing. Nadia, too, was subjected to a therapeutic regime to find ways in which her potentialities in other directions could be maximized. The net effect was that she started talking and stopped drawing. Nigel Dennis comments, We are left with a genius who has had her genius removed, leaving nothing behind but a general defectiveness. What are we supposed to think about such a curious case? It should be added, this is a point dwelt on by F.W.H. Myers, whose consideration of number prodigies opens his chapter on genius, that the faculty is strange and may disappear spontaneously, though it is, as often as not, lifelong. In the case of the twins, of course, it was not just a faculty, but the personal and emotional center of their lives. And now they are separated, now it is gone. There is no longer any sense or center to their lives. A Passage to India Bhagawandi P., an Indian girl of 19 with a malignant brain tumour, was admitted to our hospice in 1978. The tumour, an astrocytoma, had first presented when she was seven, but was then of low malignancy and well circumscribed, allowing a complete resection and complete return of function and allowing Bagawandi to return to normal life. This reprieve lasted for ten years, during which she lived life to the full, lived it gratefully and consciously to the full, for she knew, she was a bright girl, that she had a time bomb in her head. In her 18th year, the tumour recurred, much more invasive and malignant now, and no longer removable. A decompression was performed to allow its expansion, and it was with this, with weakness and numbness on the left side, with occasional seizures and other problems, that Begahwandi was admitted. She was at first remarkably cheerful, seeming to accept fully the fate which lay in store, but still eager to be with people and do things, enjoy and experience as long as she could. As the tumour inched forward to her temporal lobe and the decompression started to bulge, we put her on steroids to reduce cerebral edema, her seizures became more frequent and stranger. The original seizures were grand mal convulsions, and these she continued to have on occasion. Her new ones had a different character altogether. She would not lose consciousness, but she would look and feel dreamy. And it was easy to ascertain and confirm by EEG that she was now having frequent temporal lobe seizures, which, as Hewlings Jackson taught, are often characterised by dreamy states and involuntary reminiscence. So this vague dreaminess took on a more defined, more concrete and more visionary character. It now took the form of visions of India, landscapes, villages, homes, gardens, which Begohandi recognised at once as places she had known and loved as a child. Do these distress you? We ask. We can change the medication. No, she said with a peaceful smile. I like these dreams. They take me back home. At times there were people, usually her family or neighbours from her home village. Sometimes there was speech or singing or dancing. Once she was in church, once in a graveyard, but mostly there were the plains, the fields, the rice paddies near her village, and the low, sweet hills which swept up to the horizon. Were these all temporal lobe seizures? This first seemed the case, but now we were less sure, for temporal lobe seizures, as Hewlings Jackson emphasised, 
and Wilde at Penfield was able, by stimulation of the exposed brain, to confirm, tend to have a rather fixed format, a single scene or song, unvarying, reiterated, going with an equally fixed focus in the cortex, whereas Bhagawandi's dreams had no such fixity, but presented ever-changing panoramas and dissolving landscapes to her eye. Was she then toxic and hallucinating from the massive doses of steroids she was now receiving? That seemed possible. But we could not reduce the steroids. She would have gone into coma and died within days. And a steroid psychosis, so-called, is often excited and disorganised, whereas Begahwandi was always lucid, peaceful and calm. Could they be, in the Freudian sense, fantasies or dreams? Or the sort of dream madness which may sometimes occur in schizophrenia? Here again we could not be certain, for though there was a phantasmagoria of sorts, yet the phantasms were clearly all memories. They occurred side by side with normal awareness and consciousness, Hewlings Jackson, as we have seen, speaks of a doubling of consciousness, and they were not obviously over or charged with passionate drives. They seemed more like certain paintings or tone poems, sometimes happy, sometimes sad, evocations, revocations, visitations to and from a loved and cherished childhood. Day by day, week by week, the dreams, the visions, came oftener, grew deeper. They were not occasional now, but occupied most of the day. We would see her wrapped as if in a trance, her eyes sometimes closed, sometimes open but unseeing, and always a faint, mysterious smile on her face. If anyone approached her or asked her something, as the nurses had to do, she would respond at once, lucidly and courteously. But there was, even among the most down-to-earth staff, a feeling that she was in another world and that we should not interrupt her. I shared this feeling and, though curious, was reluctant to probe. Once, just once, I said, Bhagwandi, what is happening? I am dying, she answered. I am going home. I am going back where I came from. You might call it my return. Another week passed, and now Bagawandi no longer responded to external stimuli, but seemed wholly enveloped in a world of her own, and though her eyes were closed, her face still bore its faint, happy smile. She's on the return journey the staff said. Soon she'll be there. Three days later she died, or should we say she arrived, having completed her passage to India. When Oliver Sacks found out that he was dying and he had only months to live, he wrote an essay in the New York Times in which he said, he intended to live in the richest, deepest, most productive way I can. I want and hope in the time that remains to deepen my friendships, to say farewell to those I love, to write more, to travel if I have the strength, to achieve new levels of understanding and insight. I think it would be a fitting memorial indeed if we all took those words to heart and sought to continue them in our own lives. We'll be back next week with part two of our Oliver Sacks Memorial featuring more stories from his book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. For now, a big thank you to my mom, Lisa, for reading some of these stories with me. She'll also be back next week. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If you're interested in hearing more episodes of Our Brief Hour, check out our channel on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, click the Browse Channels link in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, and search Our Brief Hour. You'll find recordings of all our shows, as well as some side projects that we've done. Until then, have a great Friday, have a great weekend, and take care.